We are live from the Promise Institute at UCLA in Los Angeles, California. My name is Afia Williams, and I look forward to facilitating our dialogue today. In conjunction with the International Day of Tolerance, we have an exciting program around identity, belonging, and the Armenian genocide. We are going to shed light on this critical issue, um, and we at Global Nomads Group created a short virtual reality experience entitled Serun that is inspired by the film The Promise and set on the uh, filmed on the set of The Promise. And we have two special guests here, Terry George and Eric Israelian from that project. Um, and so we're going to jump right in with introductions. And so I'll have you guys prompt the question. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, my name's good morning. Good evening. <laughs> uh, my name's Terry George. I'm the writer director uh, of the film The Promise. I'm here with Eric Israelian, one of the producers of The Promise. Hello, everyone. My name is George Bandek, 11th grader at Clark Magnet High School. I'm Tenny Oliverdian. I'm also an 11th grader at Clark Magnet High School. I'm Ethan Rosler, and I'm a senior at Crescenta Valley High School. Hi, I'm Sarah Fazelli, and I'm an 11th grader at Crescenta Valley High School. And we'd love to hear from our young people in Armenia. Mm -hmm. Hello from Armenia. Nice to meet you. Uh, our group members are from Aragazavan and Hatsik community. Uh, we are 15 years old and uh, one interesting fact about us is that Hatsik in Armenian means bread. Thank you. Uh, hello, this is Sarah from Jordan and Ruby Martinsian. Uh, I'm 19 years old and Ruby is 18. Um, we live in Jordan, of course. And uh, a fun fact about Jordan is that the traditional dish in Jordan, which is called mansa, is eaten by hands. Thank you. Thank you, and to our live audience members, um, we invite you to welcome and say hello in our chat room. Let us know where you're joining us from. We're excited to have you. Thank you. Um, we're going to jump right in uh, to our part one, which is about the cultural and historical understanding. Um, in the early 19th century, the Armenian genocide resulted in the death of 1.5 million people and 450,000 survivors. And yet, as major as this event was, we all carry different experiences, knowledges, and perspectives on it. Um, so we're going to start our conversation with asking our young people, where did you learn about the Armenian genocide? Where did you get your information from? And what do you know? And so we actually are going to start in Jordan. I'd like to know what you know about the Armenian genocide. Um, well, as my own perspective, I learned about the Armenian genocide since I was a child, uh, by my family, of course, um, by teaching me our language, our uh, traditions, and of course, uh, about the Armenian genocide, each and every year, we memorize the 24th of April um, as the Armenian genocide's uh, date, and uh, by uh, singing and dancing and uh, telling our stories uh, about the Armenian genocide. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, hello again, first of all. And uh, I would like to say that Armenians uh, were known to build their own churches and uh, schools everywhere they go. Uh, and it had a main uh, influence for us to learn our history. But uh, for me, actually, my grandfather was the one to, t uh, to tell me stories about my grandfather uh, who escaped uh, uh, from the genocide and uh, saw his family being killed in front of him and uh, he held his sister, two year old, two, two year, two year old sister and uh, walked uh, holding her the walk of death. Uh, he was asked to sell uh, his sister but uh, his answer was I prefer to kill her than sell her to you. So this was my story. I'd like to hear some from the uh, US. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
I am not Armenian, but I was born in Glendale, which is a large Armenian community. And growing up, I was told about it a lot. And um, in high school, we, every time the Armenian genocide is commemorated, we would all um, participate and, you know, put, we'd put tape over our mouths and, you know, just our community is a large, you know, we have a lot of advocates for the uh, exposure of this event that took place so long ago. And then for me, as an Armenian American, I learned a lot through my family, just like the youth in Jordan said, I can relate to that. So my family has always been passing down stories. We've always been talking about it. But more recently, I've kind of delved more into the details. And I've learned that through both uh, my school district, Lendl Unified School District, when they brought uh, this event called Camp Darfur to our school, Clark Magnet High School. They had a setup of tents where they had uh, multiple genocides within the tents and it had evidence, textual evidence and more details. And I've also additionally learned through uh, an organization that I'm a part of, the Armenian Youth Federation. They've taught me a lot more about the details and the separate events that went on. But so now we have a question to Armenia and if Jordan wants to jump in and answer afterwards, then we can do that too. I just wanted to ask, what is your experience living in Armenia and Jordan, which is still very close to Turkey, the nation that has repeatedly denied the existence of the Armenian genocide? Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Lilith. Uh, we have learned about Armenian genocide from uh, our early ages, and later we uh, we enhance our knowledge in school. And now uh, I want to tell a story that I heard from my neighbor. Uh, the woman who told me the story said that. Uh, she was only uh, three, four years old that uh, the Armenian genocide happened. Uh, she told me about their life in that years, and it was just uh, awful. Uh, the Turks were very unkind to them. Uh, they were killing them, and uh, and people were starving. Uh, so they were so cruel. And but then the woman who told me said that. Um, some Turks had an empathy to them, uh, to their family, and uh, took them and took care of them. They lived many years in Turkey, and then, after finishing Armenian genocide, uh, they came back to their homeland. Thank you. Uh, I want to introduce my teacher's grandma's story about genocide. She said that uh, her grandma was one of the victims of genocide, and uh, Turkish took her in, uh, with uh, other Armenians and uh, locked them in the one room. And uh, that night they were planning how to kill them and they decided to burn uh, them in that room. Uh, but as knowing Turkish, uh, my uh, teacher's grandma understand uh, uh, that they want to uh, kill them. and. Um, she can help herself and others. So uh, I want to say that uh, knowing uh, foreign languages is helpful and uh, important in every situation for life. Thank you. Okay. I want to tell you a story. I did research four years ago, and one man told me a story about his grandfather. He said that his grandfather was one of the survivors in genocide, and. He after genocide, he was keeping a knife with him and he was screaming every night, having nightmares because it was awful uh, seeing the uh, seeing Turks killing people. So he kept with him knife and after, uh, when was he when he is going he was going to die, he told the story that with this knife he killed a a person who was go uh, he, who wanted to kill him. So this much. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Everyone. Everyone. Okay, uh, I would like to tell uh, that uh, in Jordan, our, our community uh, loves uh, cultural exchanges with Turkey. So uh, we as Armenians, it's uh, hard for us. Uh, but in the same time, we try to have the right opportunities to talk about the genocide and the Thank you. Right now, yes. Okay. Um, so, as an Armenian growing in the uh, in the city of Glendale, which is largely populated by many Armenians, I have heard about the Armenian genocide since I was a child, and my parents have always taught me of the atrocities the Armenian race has faced um, due to this genocide. But um, last year, Tenya and I were fortunate enough to meet a genocide survivor, which I had not done so prior um, to this uh, interview because of the sparsity of the survivors that have survived the genocide. And um, during our interview, we, um, we got to listen to Digin Marie Madeleine Salibian's story of how her family was deported and displaced into Syria, um, which the Derizor Desert was in Syria, and um, how Digin Marie Madeleine Salibian had to adjust and start from nothing, but was fortunate enough to become a midwife and um, bringing babies brought happiness to her due to the death she had seen during her youth. And this really uh, resonated with me because I got to see how the genocide had affected many lives and how uh, survivors had traveled over um, miles, uh, had traveled miles, but have still resonated and have still uh, stayed with the pains they had suffered throughout the genocide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your responses. Um, I want to remind our audience at home or at school, please uh, ask us any questions or share your comments. I know we have people logging in from Morocco, from the East Coast, from Atlanta, North Carolina. Um, we're so happy to have you. Um, but now I want to talk to Terry and Eric about why it's important. Um, why did you decide to tell your story through the film, The Promise? And why is it important to tell stories like these? Well, I, I previous to the promise, I made a film called Hotel Rwanda, which told the story of uh, what happened to a group of people during the Rwandan genocide, which was that, um, a horrific uh, slaughter uh, in the Central African country of Rwanda uh, in 1994, and um, and that film. Uh, which starred Don Cheadle, um, had a major impact around the world. Um, the President Bush watched it twice, and uh, it became a rallying uh, point for the, the movement against genocide in Darfur and Sudan. And having learned of the power of a film to tell a story to different communities around the world, I thought I was approached by Eric uh, uh, and the, the producers to become involved in uh, making a film about the Armenian genocide. And I had learned in my research for the Rwandan genocide, I'd learned quite a bit about what had taken place in the Ottoman Empire in the first years, uh, or the, the second decade of the 20th century. Uh, and this slaughter of the Armenian population by the Ottoman Empire became the 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 I get the inspiration for a lawyer called uh, Gabriel Lemkin to create a law around the word genocide, uh, and he created he wrote a law that was passed by the UN that basically said that the, any uh, attempt to slaughter a nation, a tribe, a group, an ethnic group would be this crime of genocide, which is considered the highest uh, crime on the, the legal uh, charter of the UN. So I was anxious that the Armenian genocide be recognized around the world as such, because many countries still refuse to recognize the crime itself. And I was approached by Eric, and perhaps Eric will explain the, the background of why we wanted to make the film itself. Sure. So first of all, I wanted to say that uh, we're so grateful to Terry and the entire team. Uh, you know, so many people, countless 
numbers of people that really participated and put their heart and soul to create this, put their heart and soul into this project to create this you know, visual museum, thanks to the generosity of uh, Kirk Kerkorian, who basically made a commitment to make this film despite so many decades of denial and even suppression of attempts to make a film, a, a large Hollywood type production around the Armenian genocide. And, and the point was not just to remember the past, but to draw parallels to what our present day humanitarian crises uh, remind people how connected we all are because even just looking at the people in this room and the people on the screen, uh, you know, even if you're not Armenian, many different cultures and countries and religions have suffered similar atrocities and unfortunately the patterns keep repeating themselves and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're fortunate to be with here with all of you today to talk about this opportunity for learning but um, you know the armenian genocide unfortunately has so many lessons to be learned because of the uh, approach to dehumanizing a minority population uh, discrimination governmental uh, control of freedom of speech and all of the other things that sometimes we take for granted in the United States. You can see that uh, when when one group of people is in power and chooses to look at another group of people as something less than human, uh, horrific things can occur and they occur very quickly. And I think uh, Mr. Kerkorian had a vision that we would create this visual museum regardless of you know, kind of the, the concerns and fears and silly conversations about the market and things like that. So we need to have a permanent record uh, that will then be inspirational for other people to go and learn from. And that's essentially what we tried to do. And Terry and Robin Swicord wrote a beautiful story and we had, you know, the best actors in the world and uh, other producing colleagues are not here right now, but uh, Mike Medavoy and Bill Horberg worked so closely with us and, um, you know, it's, it's, we're very proud to have all of you here to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, and so very poignant. And we know that the film is also very powerful and educating and that visuals are important in educating people who are not familiar. Um, and it works nicely because we have a question from our audience and they are actually curious to know from our students why we feel that young people are not educated about the Armenian genocide and how can we change this? I know we spoke this week about how there's like two, one to two lines in the history book on this. Um, why, why is this? I'll start here and then we can maybe ask our, our friends in Jordan or Armenia. So I think that the youth need to be a little more educated on it because it did happen a long time ago. It's been more than a hundred years at this point. It's not what uh, people would think of or refer to as a modern issue, although it very much is. So the Armenian genocide, as it was the first genocide of the century, it was um, kind of downplayed by other genocides as well, although it was it served as the inspiration, but many people don't know this, because when we learn about the Holocaust in school or we learn about the more uh, recent genocides like the one in Rwanda or the one in Darfur or Sudan, um, we're just more of learning about the facts about what happened there. We're not learning about why these people actually commit these atrocities because sometimes there really is no explanation for a type of mass murder that can be defined like this. So we just need more information about the past so we can uh, kind of draw parallels to what's happening right now so we can ensure that in the future nothing like this ever happens again. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, we just had another comment that ties really nicely to that connecting the Rwandan and Armenian genocide. And they learned this in French class. Um, and so instead of answering that question, I would like to know um, from our students, Armenia, like, is do you know of, can you identify any comparisons between the Rwandan and the Armenian genocide? Can you please repeat the question? Definitely. Um, we've had someone in our audience reference a comparison, learning the comparisons between the Armenian and Rwandan genocide. And we're wondering, do you all learn about these comparisons as well?
Okay. Unfortunately, no. Uh, actually, I did not expect that, but that just goes to show you how little we actually are talking about this in our history classes and how uninformed we are in like moving forward in the future um, without like history, right? Um, and so as we can tell, stories are very important in memorializing the people and the occasions that happen so that we don't forget, right? And so, um, but these are often stories about things that happened in a different time or a different place. And so now we wanna shift the conversation to talk about what we're currently experiencing. Um, and we know that injustice is still happening around the world. And so we'd like to know what are some of the experiences that you've had in your life today as young people um, around injustice. And we can start with on in Los Angeles. So um, recently in the current political climate of the United States, uh, there has been a lot of hatred towards Mexicans in this country, and it's come from the highest order, which is our president. And it's been difficult to see thousands of people in stadiums, you know, yell hateful and, you know, a lot of bigoted <laughs> comments about my community and calling us rapists and murderers and a whole host of horrible things. And hearing this go, um, all taking place around me and some, even in my own school, just some hateful comments towards my ethnicity is, you know, really sobering because I realize these events can still take place even though we have so much modern technology and access to exposure with our cell phones and cameras and everything that it's still not 100% and we need to make sure that the events like these don't take place again in any community, not just the United States, but around the world. I mean, there are so many countries that have had genocides where the governments that committed them are still in power and no one knows about them. Like in East Timor, the Indonesian government who that committed the genocide not that long ago is still in power. And in Guatemala, the genocide against the indigenous people and in, which are, you know, mostly Mayan descent, still many of the people who committed that genocide are still in power in that country. So I think going forth, that exposure for these events must be, you know, priority number one for the world in every country and every government, every community. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. We'd like to hear, um, from Jordan, please, um, can you share some of the things that you might be experiencing as young people today? Um, well, uh, sometimes we face uh, discrimination against the Syrian refugees here. Uh, such as unemployment, and when people talk to them and uh, deal with them, they make them feel uncomfortable. Um, and also, uh, injustice is lately showing up by the community's acceptance of uh, young girls that are less than 16 getting married at this age, uh, without their choice and uh, them being uh, at, uh, for accepting this. So yeah, thank you. And um, I want uh, to hear you from Armenia, please. Thank you. I want to share my personal uh, story uh, about injustice. Uh, it, it is about bullying. Um, so it's, uh, it's a very strong stereotype in uh, Armenia that uh, if you're a, a girl, you just cannot have a short hair, and uh, if you uh, like cut your hair, the community will uh, judge you and start to gossip you in every time. Uh, uh, people uh, don't understand that uh, you want to be different and uh, you want to uh, uh, show off your fashion and uh, something else. And uh, like uh, it's very important that you have a friend that uh, with, uh, they that they stand with you, and relatives. Uh, and uh, like my friend uh, said me that it's very uh, important and uh, it's very good that you want to be different in your uh, community. And I think that it's uh, very good that you have a, a like a friend friends that uh, can be with you in every situation, like uh, bullying in this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to add something. 
our teachers we are from the same village and our teachers always judge her and said you don't listen your mother or father you are like why didn't you, did you do it by yourself it's actually not like this she asked her father and mother and they accepted and like it's it's normal when you want to be different when you sh want to show your individuality because in this world when ev everyone will be like same it, it will be boring nobody will be nobody will enjoy it nobody will be interested in it thank you and thank you all um, for sharing i want to again speak to our audience please feel free to share any of your experiences that you've had with us as well. Um, and now that we've heard a little more about what's happening today um, and learning from other people's experiences through storytelling, like in the Armenian genocide, um, how might faraway events or recent events trigger our value systems, right? So how might they in, employ us to action uh, through our values? And so we'd love to hear some of the things that all of our young people find valuable in their day-to-day -day lives and how that encourages them to take action against injustice. And we are coming back to you, Armenia. Um, can you share with us a value that you find important and how it activates you against injustice? Thank you for the question. One of the value for me is curiosity. Uh, if we stay within the limits, what we already knew, knew, life will get boring. So that's why I appreciate curiosity. And that's why I count it as a value. So it's important to know what happened in the world, what, what is happening now, what happened before for being uh, self, uh, for self development, for gaining new, new knowledge, and for using it in all future plans. Uh, so uh, I think that family is the most important and valuable thing for every single person. And uh, our family members are next to us and can help us in every situation. And uh, also Armenians are whole family and we should stand up for our rights. And also forgiveness. Uh, to be clear, the purpose of forgiveness is not to absolve someone after sin committed against you, but uh, it, uh, to, be, uh, to free yourself from the pain and the anger that is keeping you stuck. Like when you for forgive, you, uh, you are better able to uh, keep moving forward with your life. Thank you. Hi, Jordan. Um, what about you? What are some of your values that ignite action against injustice? Uh, my values were, uh, um, were family and uh, um, <clears throat> uh, were family and uh, okay. Uh, Actually, family is uh, the most important value for me, and but I have chosen to talk about uh, some ways to uh, uh, to uh, to not other and uh, just uh, uh, as uh, youth campaigns and uh, demonstrations, and uh, I wanted to talk also about uh, the social media. Uh, which is a very important way that uh, it affects the new generation, uh, uh, such as uh, sharing uh, hashtags, uh, making pages. Yes. Thank you. My personal value that I chose was change, because I feel that when fighting injustice today, change is the one way to actually take it on. and. I feel that change every day is the way to get people to actually stand up and be different just by changing the way you think, the way you think about people and your perspective on life. And that's how I feel we can fight injustice. Thank you. And um, choosing one value for me was very tough because there were many valuable values 
that are important to the person. And um, but one of my top values would definitely be community because I feel as though everyone deserves an opportunity to belong and feel as though they're um, they belong to a group or they're equal to others. And um, during um, terrible acts of wrongdoing, such as genocides, um, it seems as though the people that are being killed are a minority and don't feel as though they belong, which is what ends up to kill the largest group and to destroy the race that is being killed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. all again for sharing. Um, and that leads us perfectly, actually, George, into talking about the ways that like small comments, small actions, small phrases, maybe intentional or unintentional, can target people, right, and make them feel other. Um, and we think of intolerance as large-scale events, right? So like the Armenian genocide is huge, but we know that those small actions happen as well. Um, so we'd like to also hear about some of the microaggressions or these small actions or phrases that we all have heard in our life um, that don't make us feel very good, that make us feel othered by being ourselves. Um, and I'd like to start with Armenia. <clears throat> One injustice that we meet every day is people who have special needs. They are ordered, or, ordered but Armenia, mm -hmm. yeah, but Armenia tries to get them together. And one of the organization is co-op. So, uh, okay, they are ordered by their parents. They keep their children in houses and they don't allow them to, to go even to school because they said, like, the, uh, children will treat you bad. So that's why they, they afraid, afraid to allow their children to go out. Hi, Jordan. Um, can you share with us some of your experiences with this, with microaggressions or small actions that have made you feel othered? Well, I'm going to talk about myself, me as Serbi. Uh, well, uh, growing here in Jordan, and um, well, uh, like a small action, but my professor calls my name in the university, uh, and all the students looking at me like, uh, you're different, what's this name? Uh, it makes me feel uncomfortable, but at the same time, I find it a challenge uh, to explain this to people and uh, to tell them about Armenians, about uh, our history, and uh, about our traditions. Thank you. In my classroom right now, we're currently talking about women's suffrage and women getting rights. And as a woman, I find this topic very important and like needs to be talked about a lot more but you'll hear comments that just come around all around you just saying little things like oh but a woman should be in the kitchen like just stuff like that and it offends me personally and just most women in the room and i just feel like little phrases like that that's what shoots down rights and shoots down people's idea to be who they are thank you Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and Terry and Eric, as we've heard these experiences that our young people are going through, what might your advice be for them um, as activists, like standing up for themselves or doing the right thing in their own communities? Any advice? Well, as we've heard, um, the need to be tolerant, the need to recognize difference in people, and how in the past, throughout history and to today, um, evil governments, uh, evil uh, politicians have manipulated the differences in people uh, and to create fear. The basic stimulus for genocide is fear, fear of other people, fear of, the, of someone being different and that other person encroaching on your property or your space or your ethnicity. 
So it's really important for everyone as activists if they recognize small incidents of intolerance, of persecution of someone because their hair is too short, their skin color is different, they speak a different language, they have different customs. We have to right away recognize that as a seed of hatred and genocide and denounce it. And denounce it among your friends, denounce it in paper, denounce it on video, on social media. Identify each of these little incidents. And if we can stop these small moments of intolerance, of hatred, then you stop the bigger uh, growth of hatred between communities and genocide. So I think it's really important for everyone. Once you spot some intolerance, don't be quiet about it. Silence is actually is encouraging the seeds of genocide. Don't be silent. Speak up on social media and film with your friends. Thank you. And actually, we have a great question from the audience now for you, Eric. Sure. On the spot, um, we have an educator who's asked, she says, my, she's in Kentucky, she says, my young people have never experienced genocide and often don't experience injustices like these. How can we create empathy in students who might have that reality? Well, one opportunity is what we're doing today is basically bringing communities and cultures together, educating them, and using technology such as virtual reality to give them a window into another time, another place, another culture. Um, as Terry said, you know, I think even if they haven't experienced genocide, look, I haven't experienced genocide myself. My great grandparents were genocide survivors, but when you you read and you talk to people and you learn about history, you realize how connected we all are. Um, you know, I, we've experienced people not being kind. We've experienced people being intolerant or cruel. That is a microcosm of what happens on a major scale when there's genocide. So I think we can all choose to be kind. You can embrace people's differences, in fact. I think it's one of those things I think about, you know, why can't we uh, rejoice in the fact that we're all different and that we we utilize each other's strengths to kind of have the greater good. You know, I personally enjoy learning about other cultures. I, learn, I enjoy meeting people from different backgrounds and religions and learning about their history. And, um, you know, one of the amazing things about this country, for example, is the fact that people have come from all over the world. And some of the, the greatest entrepreneurs and humanitarians and athletes or any, any artists, anyone we've looked up to has had a uh, background from somewhere else. Uh, in many cases. So I think, you know, I think regardless of where you are, even if you feel like you've been kind of in an isolated or sheltered environment without exposure, it, you have to take steps to educate yourself. Um, as Terry said, you know, never stay silent. That's why we made this project, for example, because we know that no matter how many times we have history lessons or uh, lectures or books written about the subject, without actually seeing a story, and you know, using storytelling to evoke the emotions and to hopefully stimulate the interest and in wanting to go and learn more, uh, it won't happen. So I think uh, you know, throw yourself into it. You know, there are so, so many great organizations that are focused on trying to involve young people in, in social issues. Uh, I think you got to take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you both. That's very wise way to wrap up our conversation. And I know our time has flown and it's been a brief but very powerful conversation um, on this very valuable day, International Day of Tolerance. Um, I know at Global Nomads Group, we recognize that it's our duty every day to embrace change, um, to be curious and to explore others um, and to, to be empathetic, uh, lastly. Um, and so, I want to do another round robin before we sign off and hear any final words from our young people. We are going all the way back to Armenia and we will end here. Um, thank you all. Armenia. Uh, can I ask a question? Okay, uh, well, you have uh, to Terry George. Well, you have heard lots of opinions and uh, spent much money on the uh, promised movie. And I want to know, uh, 
did the movie met your expectations or there is something you would like to change or add? Thank you. I, when you, as I travel around the world releasing The Promise, I realized that yes, it, it, it fulfilled our expectations. You, as a filmmaker, you always want to change a lot of, I see things in, in the film that no one else sees. I can see little flies on the wall behind the actors. So there's, there are small stuff that I'd love to change, but the story, the, the message of the promise, of, of tolerance, of people surviving hatred uh, and, and, and enormous cruelty, and their ability to survive has reached out around the world, and we're very proud of that, of the promise, of the Saroon VR, of the Keep the Promise campaign. So, yeah, sure, as a filmmaker, I'd like to change a lot. As a storyteller, I'm very happy with what we have done. I'm very proud of it. And I was delighted to go to Armenia to, uh, four weeks ago now uh, and meet the Catholicos and the president and just feel how, uh, how the population in Armenia were so grateful that this film was made. And I'm going to Cuba in two weeks to show the promise. I'm then going to Japan. It's opening in France next week. So our message is getting out across the world, and that's a wonderful thing to be part of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Jordan, any final question or words for us? Uh, I would like to say uh, it has been such an amazing uh, experience, and we're honored to be with you in this uh, webcast and uh, meeting all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I would also like to say that I am really grateful to see such a great film and uh, to meet you, uh, film producer Eric and uh, film uh, director Katie. It was really good uh, to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Any final words here from Los Angeles? Yes, so I wanted to thank you guys all for the great information and the conversation. I learned a lot that I didn't really know before. And I'd like to all prompt everyone to continue to fight for justice today. Because as we've all realized, you must introspect into the mistakes in the past to ensure that they don't uh, happen again in the future. So because of this, we can also kind of relate back to the quote that Hitler said when he was asked about what he was going to do if he was going to be um, punished for what the atrocities he committed against the Jewish people. He said, who after all speaks today about the annihilation of the Armenians? And that has to be us. We have to be the ones to speak about it today because a genocide denied is a genocide continued and we can not ensure like protection for other nations and other cultures without recognizing other genocides first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, actually, I want to do special thank yous to Terry and Eric for being here, to the Promised Production team, to Orla for the Serun virtual yes, reality. Orla George. She's amazing. Where's Orla George? Um, <laughs> and, uh, to our young people all over the world, to our audience members, mm -hmm. to the Children of Armenia Fund in Armenia, to the Committee of Armenian Students here in public schools in LA, to my team here and our videographer. Um, we are very grateful for you, and we want to invite you to watch the room on our YouTube channel or on our Global Nomads group virtual reality app on your phone. Um, it's a great experience, and we invite you to explore this topic and other tough topics with your families, with your communities, and in your classrooms. Uh, thank you all. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.